Okay. And then the lead. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Welcome to our thir Thursday morning city council study session. And we have uh, three things to talk about. Uh, the main thing is we're going to have um, health science students uh, ask us some questions and engage in some conversation with us. I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, potential fluoride uh, considerations scheduled for Monday's meeting. And then Councilmember Mum, I, I couldn't tell whether you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, mutual aid fire types of things as well. Um, or if you wanted to do that in a different situation. Do you mean with the current fire situation or fire planning? What I, I only caught a, just a bare minimum of what you were saying. So whatever you were talking about before we gaveled the meeting, I didn't know if you wanted to update council members on that, which is fine to do right now if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm happy to do, share with what the mayor said, but yeah. whatever you want to do I'm yeah. at the end. No, do it. No, do it. Do it right now. Go ahead and do it right now. Oh, okay. Um, I just spoke to the mayor and... Uh, the um, uh, fire chief has been assisting down south, and, and we do have several people housed here in Spokane, Spokane hotels. Uh, and so I just made the request that she would get her cabinet if there were other areas with which we could offer support, sort of uh, like solid waste assistance. After a fire, often there's a lot of solid waste needs. And uh, perhaps the library could offer um, connectivity assistance or other assistance and just maybe check with her cabinet to see because we are the closest large city. Uh, AWC has also reached out their president, Sue Ng Moody, and I have been speaking. She has a lot of uh, experience as a small town surviving fires from what happened in Twist. And uh, Peter uh, from AWC uh, from the administration side is also reaching out. So we're trying to find ways to assist. Uh, and right now, Spokane is a city mostly. Uh, we have some new residents, <laughs> uh, and uh, they they have nothing. So um, th there's a lot of coordination happening with the Red Cross. And I just, uh, if I hear more from the mayor, I'll, I'm happy to share. But there might be some things we might be able to do in an emergency situation. I'm not exactly sure what legally we can do, but wanted to see if there was something we could do. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for that update and um, for, again, adding support to whatever the administration was already thinking about, but it's good that they hear from council as well. So that's good. All right. So we're going to transition into um, this dialogue with the health sciences students and uh, Priyanka, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, and then you're going to be leading it from the student side, and I know you're going to have questions uh, for us, and I'm going to, I'm hoping Priyanka will send the questions to me, and I'll try to find out which council member is interested in answering, or if nobody volunteers to answer, then I'll maybe pick somebody uh, to do that. So hopefully we can get to, um, on the screen, so I can see, um, most of the boxes. And so just go ahead and wave at me if it's something you're particularly interested in answering. But um, Priyanka, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and um, just give us a thumbnail sketch of the Health Sciences Student Association and um, what, what the purpose is for today. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Priyanka Bashana. I'm the president of the Health Sciences Student Advocacy Association. Um, I'm actually going to pass it to my Vice President, Chris, who'd like to introduce everyone to um, the event and the format that we have planned for today. Thank you. Yes. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Schlenk. I'm the Vice President for the Health Sciences Student Advocacy Association. We're an organization dedicated to policy for science and science for policy with a specific focus on student advocacy. Um, we're pleased to bring you our first event for the fall semester titled Know Your City. We are fortunate enough to have the city council members to answer our specific health policy questions and also allow for a conversation with our city city's leaders. We're focusing our discussion on health policy to allow for a streamlined discussion today. Um, the format will be as such. Um, Green kind of mentioned it. 
Um, the questions and discussion will be moderated by Priyanka, the president of uh, HASA, and then the questions will be directed to um, city council president, who will direct the questions to the relevant member or maybe whoever would like to answer the question. Um, to allow for um, all the questions to be asked, uh, we'll allow about five minutes for each question to keep the discussion moving. Um, Philip will be keeping time and will give a 30 second warning to the participants on when they should kind of be wrapping up their uh, questions and answers. Um, and then uh, ideally at the end, if you have a question, um, feel free to use the Q&A box. Uh, we'll have Lakin going through the chat, kind of sorting through the questions. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll hopefully have um, some audience uh, questions that can be answered. So a big thank you to City Council for joining us today. We really appreciate taking the time out of your busy days to have a conversation with us. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and at this moment, I would like to hand back the mic over to Priyanka, who will be asking the questions and leading the discussion. Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to um, get us started right away. And um, within our kind of five-minute window, if, um, if we'd like, we can keep this going as a conversation. We have plenty of questions and sub-questions and lots of things to ask all of you. Okay, so to get started, um, Council President begs maybe you or someone else can answer this for us. Um, as we understand it, Spokane is a strong mayor council system. So what does that really mean? What does policy making look like under Spokane strong mayor system? I will, I will take that one uh, first for myself. So um, basically 20 years ago, the Spokane voters uh, voted on a charter and in Washington state, there's some default provisions for city government, but you can become a charter city if you're of a certain size and the voters choose to do that. So we did that. And um, what that, when you hear the term strong mayor, what it really refers to is before that, we had a full-time city manager who uh, supervised all the employees and ran the city. And the mayor was really just a member of the city council in, in a more ceremonial position. Um, but if you actually dive into our charter, which is essentially our city constitution, they didn't just make a strong mayor, they also made a strong council. And really, we have a, lots of checks and balances uh, between the two uh, that are there. And I like to say, at least informally, what it really means is uh, you can't get anything significant done unless you get full agreement from both the mayor and the council. There are different things you can do, for instance, uh, we can approve uh, new positions in the budget, um, but if the mayor simply doesn't hire the people do it, the money will just sit there and the positions will not be filled. And um, similar, the mayor can announce a new initiative that he or she wants to uh, undertake, and if the council doesn't allocate the money to do it, uh, the mayor can't do it. So uh, it really drives us to work together and find common ground, um, and I joked around a little bit with the mayor after the election because we kind of came from different political perspectives. Uh, we both narrowly won by only um, a few votes each in our races, and I was pretty sure that nobody voted for both of us. They, uh, so between the two of us, uh, and I'm just one council member but runs and the one that runs citywide, we pretty much had the whole city. So when we can come together on something, um, that that's ideal, that's generally. But um, if we can't, there are, you know, rules of the game uh, that each side can um, utilize to try to advance what they think is best for the city. Uh, but short answer is you to do anything really significant beyond just day to day operations, um, you need to work together. Um, but in terms of actual day to day operations, the mayor supervises people, the council does not. We allocate money and set the policy for the city and have some checks and balances beyond that. And I don't know if any other council members want to chime in since I took that over. Not seeing any, so go ahead. So um, along those lines, then, what health and science policies have um, has your entire team been able to agree on? And what um, health and science policies is the city currently working on? 
Uh, I don't know if there's someone that wants to talk about their current response to homelessness. I would say that's one of our major ones. Uh, is there any council member that wants to talk about what we've been up to on that? I can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, yeah, so um, homelessness and housing obviously are health issues that we take really seriously. And, um, uh, you know, we've done a lot at the city. We have a lot of work to do still. But um, this current mayor has put out a housing and homeless plan, which we haven't had in the past. So it's really exciting to see some movement on that um, to get some permanent spaces for us to have homeless shelters um and so we're currently we just opened up a shelter on mission street mission and division and um, that's a wraparound service um uh facility so we're hoping to get people into housing um through that and then we also contract out with other agencies like volunteers of america transitions um and uh public charities to do different types of um, their own programs. Um, and we do also have an outreach team that goes out. Um, that's one of my favorite, uh, things that we do at the city. Um, we have folks who go out and are able to communicate with, um, people who are experiencing homelessness and try to get them into services and housing. Um, I'm a firm believer that, that you have to really build that trust, um, because people who are in that situation have, um, have been wronged and um, have a lack of trust um, in the system. And so uh, so I'm really glad we have our outreach team that goes out and makes those relationships and helps people get into housing and um, get on to other services they need. Um, yeah, and so that's just a quick overview. I know you guys probably have a ton more questions, but um, it's something that I'm definitely really seriously passionate about. So if any of you guys have follow-up questions um, or want to get do a Zoom meeting or anything like that, I'm always happy to um, talk further about it. Thank you. So um, about that, so Councilmember Burke, has the priorities for that team shifted at all since COVID-19? Um, Councilmember Mom has something to say. I'll answer your question and then you can go go to her. Um, I think um, I think it's massively changed. I think we're going to see, in my opinion, we're going to see um, thousands of more people who are um, going to be experiencing homelessness um, in the, in the near future. Um, we've I feel like we've already seen an uptick in um, homelessness since COVID has started, and uh, and so it is something that. You know, I feel like right now the city is playing catch up and we need to be ahead. So we have catch up and ahead to, to get to. Um, and so, you know, with strong policies around housing protections are going to be essential as we move forward. Um, and that's just my own personal opinion. Um, I know other council members have their own. Um, but I do seriously think that this is an issue that um, is going to affect a lot of our community members. Um, you know, now and then as we continue on past whatever happens with COVID, um, it's going to be a very serious issue. So, so I think it's m most essential that we focus on what's going on and, um, and that we, you know, try to address some of these, these really, really relevant issues. So. So my input, uh, thank you, um, is that often our policies are not what you might consider health and science related, but if you really dig deep, just about everything we do is, we have more of a touch on, on funding uh, and permanent change, which, which affects things like the environment and climate change. That's probably one of the biggest things that we do in terms of investment. The biggest investment our city's made in its history is cleaning up the river. We spent $350 million uh, doing sewer treatment and wastewater treatment that, um, and stormwater treatment that needed to happen. You know, that's affecting fish, it's affecting uh, PCBs. Uh, so how, where we place our money in some ways, I think says more about us as a city than our, our written policies. 
And another area where we have put a lot of money is to uh, change our environment and how we plan our cities. 20 years ago, we implemented a comprehensive plan that's called Centers and Corridors, which drives uh, the density towards uh, more uh, affordable transit, walkability, and cleaner living, uh, and more healthy living. And in particular, our children, when we work with the health department and many of our health sciences um, experts and, and people in that field, uh, they're putting a lot of emphasis on how to make it easier for children to recreate and to access schools. So we put several million dollars a year toward improving our walkability to our schools, especially in places where we don't have busing. Uh, when we have the obesity rates that we do in children, we have to make it easier for kids to get to school and not just put them on buses all day or expect their parents to drive them. So those are just a couple of areas where we spend millions of dollars every year to improve the health of our community that might not um, be as relevant. And then I'll just also put in fire safety. If that wasn't more evident as it was this last week, you can see <laughs> it creates instant homeless people. Now we have over 200 people plus living in our city who are homeless um, because of fire. So climate change, I'm going to pivot back to that. Um, I think that's an area where we have lots of conversations and we have to continue to spend our money, not just the policy. Thank you. Um, and I was just going to add on on the homeless, a couple of things have changed. One is uh, we've had to find new spaces that are bigger spaces so that people can do socially distancing within shelters. Uh, we've also increased the number of people we shelter during the summertime. We often uh, do more in the wintertime. And so, but based on the governor's orders, uh, we need to make sure that we're providing uh, shelter for people so that they can be socially distant and not spreading it. Also, the meal services for people who are feeding, they've become more uh, brown bagging it, uh, more than just direct meals. Um, and then lots of concern. Luckily, we have not had problems of COVID going through the shelters uh, to date. So that's been helpful. Uh, but similarly, it's not so much a, well, it is a city issue as well. Same in our jail. We've had to reduce the population in the jail. And we've done that by having judges um, determine people who are not dangerous and don't need to be in jail and figuring out other ways to supervise them. So all those things, and I think as Councilmember Mum mentioned, almost everything that we do has a science or even health uh, angle to it. And I'd say what we're trying to do a better job of is use those lenses when we do it so that we coordinate that. Um, three of us are on the regional health board and several others of us have served on it in the past. And so uh, I think we have a pretty good grounding in public health uh, when we're looking at things, even if it might be uh, just streets and sidewalks. Great. And do you think that any of these COVID-related changes will be permanent even after this pandemic has passed? Um, I, don't, I don't think we know. <laughs> uh, but that is a, a challenge. One thing I'm very excited about working with this mayor is uh, we really need a regional response to homelessness. So the county has a lot of funding, City of Spokane Valley, and people who are homeless don't really... Uh, identify jurisdictional borders. Um, and so we, I would say that's the big change that I'm hoping is going to be permanent. We have been dealing with it on a regional basis, uh, mostly because the way the funding for COVID-related homeless sheltering has been coming through is on a regional basis. But the hope is to continue that uh, process going forward. And I think, again, if we do that, we'll not only save money and provide better service, but um, just have a unified plan instead of three different jurisdictions having three different plans. Um, so that's probably the biggest change that I'm hoping we'll see go forward. So I think you've already started answering this question. Um, what, which departments in the city handle the COVID-19 response and how does your council coordinate efforts to work with those departments? 
Hmm. I am. Um, I'm just looking to see if anyone wants to jump in. I'm guessing they won't. Uh, but uh, I would. So the first thing is just to go back a little bit is. Um, Again, it's mostly the administration that's the on the ground, the, you know, write, writing contracts with shelters and food and, and different things like that, even cleaning uh, city council or city hall and where people can come and not come, um, policing, all fire, all those things tend to be administration employees and they all, all those departments and all those services have COVID-19 protocols, uh, both in terms of just safety in the moment, but also in trying to address human need out there. So the main way that the city council interacts with that is, is funding. So we've gotten a lot of grants and financial assistance and they have to come to city council to approve accepting them and approve spending them. Um, we don't get too involved in the day-to-day -day operations uh, of it. We get reports. We have every Monday afternoon, we have a different committee that uh, consists of about one fourth of the city's various lines of businesses. So we get the updates from staff then and give them our feedback. But again, that's really just advisory. And then occasionally we actually will write a law or make a big, big change about it. So we did one on homeless shelters um, a couple months ago where we said we wanted to make it actually the law in the city that we did not close shelters precipitously when there was demonstrated need out there. And uh, that was one that we had some disagreements with the administration, not on the goal of sheltering people, but how flexible they could be. Uh, so in that sense, we sort of set up some guardrails of when they can close shelters or not. But most of the time, 95, 98% of the time, it's just a conversation and information sharing and trying to get on the same page, knowing there's always more unmet need than we'll ever have the resources to do, but trying to maximize what we can do. And Council President, if I yep. may. Please. Um, one of the other things that I think um, a lot of people don't really realize about city council is we actually do a lot of casework. And so um, a lot of times people write in um, if they are currently experiencing homelessness or if they're um, maybe feeling like they, they're on the verge of it or maybe they have some other kind of issue going on in their life, um, they can't find food or they, don't have, they can't get on unemployment, those type of things, people oftentimes don't think about emailing their um, elected officials, but we can actually help a lot of the time. And so that's another thing that I would say we do as in connection with the administration. Sometimes it can be as easy as, hey, this person doesn't have your email address. Can you, you know, get in contact with them? But sometimes it's a little bit more in depth. Um, and so a lot of these issues um, are state issues sometimes. Some of them are city issues. Some of them are county issues. Some of them are, you know, federal issues. And so sometimes it's just us connecting people with the right person to, to have that constituent talk to. Um, and so that's a big part of what I do is um, I get like tons of emails about, um, you know, things that are going on. And then I feel like my role is just connecting people with the right person to ask that question to or to get their point across to. Um, and so I think oftentimes people don't really realize that that's um, a majority of, of um, for me, a majority of what I get emails about are people who are looking for resources or um, can't figure out where to go or who to talk to about certain things. And so, um, and so with COVID, this has been a big thing for me, you know, getting emails about people who are fearful of losing their housing or um, they don't have, they can't get on unemployment is a big thing we're still seeing. Um, and so then I can connect them to the correct person um, to help um, move that process along. Um, and it's, it's, um, I think it's an overlooked resource because whenever there's an elected official looking in, sometimes the agencies are like, oh, we, yep, we're working on that. You know, they move a little bit faster. And so. Um, we have 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so anyway, that's, that's um, a big part of what I think council's role is too. Great. Great point. All right, Priyanka, back to you. Okay. So moving right along then. Um, 
So while some strides have been made in increasing innovation and science jobs here in Eastern Washington, we're still losing a majority of the researchers and clinicians that we train here. So what has city council done or what has city council planned to implement in order to improve the retention of scientists and clinicians in Eastern Spokane, Eastern Washington? <laughs> I'm Can I change up real quick? Uh, that's what I was going to suggest, Michael. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think a, a big part of that is is obviously um, creating a, a stronger uh, business climate, more housing options, more vibrant uh, community, uh, you know, creating more densities in our in our um, uh, commercial centers and in our downtown core. You know, I, I think that's what a lot of these uh, younger uh, students are really looking for is is that you know quality of life type type issues and so those are big big things that I'm focused quite a bit on uh, a lot of the time and so I think that's really what we need to do to retain is we need to have more more job offerings more housing options just just a more vibrancy in in our uh, in our community here and so I think if we can get a handle on a lot of issues we'll be able to retain um, you know just a lot of that lost. Um, uh, youth and 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 um, intelligence and, and rather than seeing them go to places like Seattle or the Bay Area, they'll they'll stay here, maybe even come here, which I think has to be our goal. Um, Michael, can you talk a little bit about our public development authority um, strategy in terms of getting manufacturing and science and biotech stuff here? Yeah, so uh, I put on the Northeast Public Development Authority, which is kind of a big swath of land, uh, also referred to often as the yard in uh, Northeast Spokane. And the the goal there uh, in the past has really uh, centered on trying to draw manufacturing jobs and more industrial type uses. Uh, and I think there's there's been a lot of conversations lately about not necessarily trying to discourage that or avoid that, but but maybe to highlight more um, other opportunities that might exist there. And as the council president mentioned, you know, perhaps um, some of these more tech related type type things, but also housing and, and other commercial options as well, uh, I think would be uh, a really good emphasis in that area. But in addition to the NEPDA, we also have the, the university district, uh, which is also its own public development authority. And I think we're going to be seeing, especially in the south end of the, that public development authority, just a lot of development over the next 10 years, which is going to include, I think, a lot of uh, research options, cancer research, um, housing options, you know, multifamily um, condos, apartments, that sort of thing, and just a, a different atmosphere, but a lot of a draw, I think, for, for some of the the more medical science-based hubs that we see in Seattle, I think, to, to maybe come our direction and, and get based there close to the U district where we've got the medical schools, of course, as you know, and then also it's, it's not that far from, from our hospitals on the, on the South Hill. So I think we've got just some real, real cool stuff on the verge of happening there. Yeah. And I just wanted to add in, so a public development authority, essentially it's a city created organization and now we're doing it in partnership with the County and we set some boundaries, and essentially, as new businesses come in and there's more property tax revenue, we are keeping those revenues in those boundaries to assist with infrastructure. Uh, for instance, in the university district, that university district bridge, which opened up a whole bunch of land that's now, there's the Catalyst building and other things going on there. And so, and each of those uh, development authorities now has uh, staff to do to recruit and manage new investments, and certainly Spokane in our in our top three now is biotech medical types of things. So I, as as Michael was saying, the future is bright. But I guess what I want to also say is that we've made those PDA changes in the relatively uh, near past, and so uh, it should only get better. So for those of you who said, "Oh, sure, every community wants that," what's different? Well, what's different is we have two medical schools now. We have these more vibrant PDAs that we're investing, and we have plans for all of them. So I'm, uh, I also believe that we will create not just a place where younger uh, science and tech professionals want to live, but where businesses will locate. And Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, Council President Bix. I was just going to say in my short term here is that I have seen Council set 
the groundwork or the framework for development. We put in place the zoning, partnerships. 30 that's seconds remaining. We, that's what we can do, but business has to come here on their own. We can only provide the environment for that. Uh, just really quickly, if I may, um, I know Council Member Mum has something to say, but I think um, to be unique about some of the things that we implement for uh, young families who are moving here, like, um, you know, really investing in childcare and early learning, um, that's a huge opportunity for our city to be looking at. And so um, I think that is also another draw for people who might want to stay um, in terms of affordability factors. There is, um, you know, affordable early learning for their young kids if they want to have children, then that is a huge draw. So. And Council Member Mom, I'll make it ahead. quick. Yeah. I think one of the missing pieces is that these PDAs don't think about where people live. And as a former pre-med student, I know you have to roll out of bed and go to lab. You've got to run down. I mean, you're working, you're, you're, you're going into, I see nodding heads. You have to be close to where you work. And there's no housing on that campus. I've seen smiles. Uh, and so it was a real flaw. We called it out early. We're pushing We've got a new South Landing plan that's talking about housing, but it's a few years away. And I think if we really want to make a commitment to doing uh, this and having these CDAs successful in science and technology, we have to think about where these people are going to live, mm -hmm. either temporarily or permanently. A lot of these people have families mm -hmm. or they're couples. You know, it has to be a livable place. It can't be an apartment box. So I think we have to work with the developers of these PDAs and the, and the businesses that are, we're talking to uh, and all the partners is think about these types of people and how they live and they live differently than the rest of us because what we created is a commuter campus and I own that. Um, but I'm working to change that. I know others are too, uh, but we got the campus within the technology in first and we should have had the housing at the same time. So hopefully we can work on that. Yep. We really do appreciate all of you working, obviously working together on all of these measures. Um, I'll just say, as a sleep researcher, you know, sometimes having to come into campus to sleep-deprived mice at like 3 a.m., I really do want to live close to campus. Yeah. Yep. So moving along here, we understand that there's a sustainability and um, climate subcommittee. So we're wondering who participates in the sustainability action subcommittee and. Um, what initiatives has that subcommittee been focusing on? All right. Well, I am going to pass that over to Kara Odegaard, who's our uh, manager for sustainability initiatives and put together our sustainability action subcommittee. And Kara, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, we do have a sustainability action subcommittee. It's a subcommittee of City Council's PIES committee, so the Public Infrastructure and Environmental Sustainability Committee. And currently we have 40-plus uh, members um, participating in an official capacity on the subcommittee, and those members are uh, come from both the private and public sector. Um, we work closely with um, public trans transportation um, organizations, STA and the Spokane Regional Health Department, um, our district. Uh, until uh, March, uh, Dr. Bob Lutz was serving in, as part of our subcommittee. Uh, and we also had um, two me members of the WSU uh, Medical School as um, participants on our subcommittee. We have since, they've, they've both moved on. And so there is an opening if you have a student in that, um, that is interested in providing a health perspective. We'd more than um, welcome their participation. Uh, but we do have a very good uh, mix of uh, business. Um, we have our public utilities represented on, our uh, VISTA is represented on the subcommittee. Um, we have natural resource managers and um, folks who do sustainability measures for their um, private sector jobs. So, and we're, when you, you asked what initiatives we're working on, um, we're really basing our focus on um, putting together a climate action plan or a draft climate action plan for public comment. And in order to do so, we're looking at where our, um, the primary uh, sources of our greenhouse gas emissions, and it can really be 
um, divided into two um, sec sectors, the built environment, so stationary energy, um, that's electricity and natural gas use, and the second um, largest is transportation, and they they're both make up approximately 50% of our emissions. And so we're focused on those areas in providing alternative transportation choices for our residents, um, trying to move away from fossil fuels and possibly towards more electric um, fuel sources for vehicles, um, and also looking at alternatives for um, energy use in our buildings, so solar um, primarily, but also have um, experts on our team who specialize in biofuels. And hopefully that answers your question, but I'm happy to follow up with anything. And I think that um, Council Member Wilkerson has to yep. I just want to comment that the Sustainability Action Committee, what has excited me most is they are actually going into neighborhoods and talking about sustainability and working to educate our young people. When I found out that, you know, electric cars will probably be the rage in less than 10 years and about the resale market of electric cars, I didn't know that. I thought my grandson would drive my clunker with gas uh, by the time I got out of high school. But taking that to a neighborhood, I know that committee has talked about sustainability in our parks and what that looks like for our community. So education, I believe, has been a big part of moving that needle forward. And I really appreciate the committee. Um, and I wanted to add just two things. One, um, our two medical students who were serving on it, they really were promoting health equity lens uh, considerations. And that, well, that was a role. So again, if there's, uh, we can get someone else from the health sciences to join us, we'd love to have that. Uh, and the other thing that I would just say that the Sustainability Committee is doing is oftentimes city operations are just day to day. We're trying to provide the best service at a reasonable price to people. And it's challenging to get your head above the water, so to speak, and look at the future. But that's what this group of 40 people does. They, they look out there. They're divided into smaller groups. They figure out real innovative things, interesting, and then they kind of put it through a process. And they focus on things that will have the biggest impact that are priced reasonably uh, when analyzed in either the short or the long term, are politically adoptable by people. So really helping council and eventually the administration focus on where we, what we can do today to really have a better tomorrow. And I've been really excited watching it. Uh, and some of them are really big, like electrifying transportation. And, some of them are smaller, like how do we get out of spraying Roundup in our parks? You know, there's places that do it and actually not only is it cheaper and doesn't have the health concern, but actually the vegetation in the parks is healthier once you adopt uh, those standards. So I don't see anyone else, so go ahead. So who does council call on to act as scientific advisors in matters of public policy on this committee or on other committees? Uh, Councilmember Burke. Thank you. Um, so I don't know how other people really run their offices, but for me, I know I have um, certain people in the community that I go to for certain issues. Um, so. For instance, if there's any water issues that come up, I usually go to the Riverkeeper, who's somebody who I know um, uses science and um, data to, to make decisions. Um, and so each issue has a specific person, person in my mind that I reach out to, somebody trusted in the community who can really um, uh, give you that evidence-based um, and, and data-driven answer to some of your questions. So that's, that's just how I um, do my, I get my information. Councilmember Mum. I try to stay away from paid lobbyists. I, I'm gonna take it a different way. When people are paid to advocate for um, a certain perspective, uh, my red flag goes up. So I try to go to neutral parties. I use a lot of, um, you know, uh, educational, um, organizations, you know, certainly our University of Washington, WSU, 
Uh, I try to look at other journals. Uh, you know, I'll look at JAMA or something. You know, I'll, I'll dig in on that kind of scientific perspective. Another really great resource for us is both our Association of Washington Cities and National League of Cities. So often when we're looking at an issue, uh, other cities have already looked at it and done the research. So in order to save time, I try, we also have this great um, sort of repository of other policies and uh, uh, research that's been done or paid for by their taxpayers. It's called MSRC, which is a municipal research arm uh, that has a really sort of a library of uh, similar policies. And it's very, very helpful to us um, because I have found after growing up here in Spokane, we often always try to recreate the wheel. And it's so much faster to find, um, not even, you know, in America, but other, other places. I know a team, and I think Kara and Brian uh, went, our council president, went to um, uh, Copenhagen and did some research there. So when we have that opportunity, uh, we haven't been able to travel now. But we, we have 30 seconds remaining. And you do um, reach out to other communities. You can learn a lot. So I don't know, Brian and Kara, if you want to mention that trip yeah i i i will mention that it was a it was funded by a foundation that paid for uh myself and some other city officials including the mayor i think kara that was before she worked for the city so she probably paid her own way to go uh but that's how we got to know each other so it turned it turned out well but it was amazing to see um things sustainability things uh there that they just take for granted uh, their bicycle transportation, their circular economy of using the waste of one plant to um, fuel the outputs of another plant. Uh, so we do that. The other thing I want to mention uh, is, again, we're very tied into the health district board. And the health district has really uh, upped its game in terms of being a policy resource. So when there's a public health issue, we can ask them to um, assist us in understanding the research on that. So. Uh, I think I just saw an email about housing there. They did something on fluoride uh, for us. Uh, and again, they don't take a stand politically what you should do. They just provide uh, the you know best research out there uh, that you can look at. So that's a, we're really fortunate in Spokane that we have them. Most counties don't have a health district of our caliber and as outward facing as, as ours is. And there are, just to throw out the bone to students, there are times when we have had interns and we've looked to student or organizations or professors and classes to help us on projects. And it's always very useful. Whitworth has done it, Gonzaga's done it, um, and, and some of the community colleges. I'm not sure if the medical schools have done it, but that's something that we, I think, as a council are going to do better at. We have some increased staff members now that we didn't used to have on policy that are can reach out and make those connections. Well, thank you for taking student voices into account. Mm -hmm. um, we have heard from some students, some less vocal students, that they're intimidated to talk to legislators, mm -hmm. council members. What advice would you give to your constituents on that? Or can you give an example of when, um, sometime when a citizen advocate impacted your decision making? Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say, uh, I mean, obviously it's easy to say this, but there really is no reason to be intimidated. Frankly, it, it's us who should be intimidated talking to others because they're the people that we work for and serve and and who we you know need to to live up to to uh, expectations for. So. I don't think there's any reason to be intimidated talking to a, a council member, but, you know, um, just, you know, I would just come in, have, know what you want to say or, or call or email, whatever it is, and know what you want to say. And, and just, uh, I think calmly share your, your concerns, your stories, your, your facts, figures, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, there's no reason to be intimidated. And frankly, all the time in terms of your second question here on, on how citizen advocates might impact your decisions, you know, I, Obviously, I think, you know, when you run for office, you run for office because you, you have certain perceptions and views and, and um, ideas. But, you know, all the time when somebody brings you some new thinking or a, a new fact or something you just didn't know before, you know, that changes your view. It might change how you vote on something. It might change how 
you think about an issue, but you know, without those inputs, which is a frustration of mine with COVID and the the lack, uh, I should say, the less uh, participation that we get from the public because of COVID, I think makes it difficult. We're not getting as many opinions and and points of views, and and so it's a much more narrow band of folks who have you know a certain certain idea but you're not getting that variety of opinions from the public that i think are so important that really does make a difference in decision making and so you know i always think about that you know anything you say might be the thing that changes the vote or solidifies a vote or or you know creates a new a new program that's really beneficial to the community any other council members want to weigh in on that uh county president Banks, i just want to make a quick yep. comment yep. so I believe as council members, including my strategy, we need to be out among people. I have said that a lot of good work happens in this building downtown, but really a lot of the work is in our community. So the people need to be really a, feel a part of them and amongst them to actually hear their voices and meet them in their space. They do not have to always come to our space. And I think that level to playing field uh, in the communication arena. And I was just going to add, um, you know, you can tell just from watching and listening to us that we're just really kind of normal people, just like you all are. And uh, and we we are the ultimate generalists on city council. There is so much that we have to take in and analyze at any time that we are not really experts at very much. And so we really lean on staff people and we lean on community members and especially I, I tell people all the time when you tell us a story that really is impactful and i people often ask well how do we have an impact and again we're not having in-person meetings right now during covid but if you come on the last night when we're voting on something i i don't see a lot of impact on changing people's minds because people have figured it out but if you come every few months and tell us the issue that you're concerned about and bring people with lived experiences. Uh, that really, I've seen over five years, has been impactful uh, for people. And so, uh, again, we have this positional authority, so perhaps people project onto us that we're intimidating, but actually we're just regular people. And I like to say that Spokane is uh, big enough to make a difference when Spokane adopts something, it, it impacts hundreds of thousands of people, both in the city and then around it. But at the same time, we're small enough that really you can, if you want to get a meeting with any of us, and you might even be able to get a meeting with the mayor. So uh, it's, it's that kind of place. So uh, be bold and take a risk and reach out, and uh, I think you'll be glad you did. Mr. President, can I? Yes. Thank you. Um, so before COVID started, um, I actually made it a priority of mine to speak to some sort of class once a week. Um, and so oftentimes I think people do have this facade that we are much more important than we actually are, that we hold some sort of um, abundance of knowledge that other people don't necessarily have. Well, um, I think going to the people is something really important. And so 30 seconds remaining. I go to a class. Uh, I was going to a class once or twice a week, whether it be kindergarten all the way up to, you know, college classes um, to just explain a little bit about what city government is and what we do kind of like this forum. Um, and I think that that kind of, you know, tempers down uh, that kind of fear there. And um, I oftentimes still get emails from people that I went to their classes from, you know, two years ago. They're like, oh, you came two years ago, and now I'm actually interested in this one thing that you said. And, um, and again, I, I, I feel like I'm a connector, right? I'm a bridge builder between different people. And so um, that's just been probably the best part of this job is to connect with young people and get them interested in, um, in local politics and then also, you know, um, understand that they can have an impact and they can start something and they can start a coalition and they can join a coalition and they can, you know, um, get involved. And so I, I love, I love this job for that reason. The rest of it's very difficult, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, they, the young. So. All right. Back to you, Priyanka. 
we appreciate it a lot, and um, we really do feel heard, and um, we really appreciate you giving us this time. So I have one last question, but before that, I just wanted to say to the audience, um, if you're listening on um, on the call itself, you can ask questions in the um, chat box here. We'll be taking questions in a minute, and if you're tuning in on um, City Channel 5 and you found this event through Facebook, you can ask the questions there and I'll go ahead and monitor that as well. So last question here. Um, so we know that the City Council is undertaking the issue of community water fluoridation. We just wanted to ask at this point, what are the barriers and benefits um, of passing an ordinance on this issue? That's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> How much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You. Uh, yeah. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson, do you want to start? And then I'll hear from anyone else who wants to talk about it. Thanks for calling me out. <laughs> In my perspective, it is a health equity issue. There is a lot of research out there, pro and con. But in doing my homework, and hearing from constituents. If those other options had been working before, we would not be here today still discussing fluoride. So if we had tablets or toothpaste or painting on your teeth, um, we just wouldn't be here. So I'm just looking at it overall, um, not just for communities of color, but for people who are disenfranchised, to me, is another access to health issue. Um, we know dental health is just as critical as any other health issue with a person. So going forward overall, to me, is something where we can make a difference. And yes, it is very divisive, but as leaders, there are times where we have to make the stand. That's why we're in the positions that we are looking for the overall health of our city. Anyone else want to share a perspective or that from that question? You're catching us a few days before we're actually going to have a debate and vote on it. So I don't know how much people want to say or not, but um, yeah. Well, I can also ask, does this question or this debate, does this feel like any other scientific issue that the city has encountered before? I wonder which issues might feel similar and why. I, I will just say I'm not sure that it is, um, has come up in the same context. The, one of the things that's unique about this issue is that there is, uh, even though 75% of uh, municipal water users have fluoride in the water, there is a national uh, movement against fluoride as well. And so when a community starts thinking about it, um, it sort of becomes on the national map and then people activate people on both sides in the community to speak about it. So I think that's, um, one thing that's a little more unique. Um, and then s as far as what's been similar in our community in the last couple of years, I would say uh, vaccines, it's very similar. Uh, again, that hasn't come to the city council, but on the health board that the four and a half years I've been on the health board, there's always uh, a group of people that are very concerned about vaccines and whether or not they're required for their um, children to have them in order to attend public school and under what conditions. And then I think similar in this last year, uh, masking requirements, social distance requirements, uh, and a lot of the COVID-19s, I uh, think they're all very similar in that uh, there's really not that much scientific debate about fluoride and vaccines and Masking and social distancing, really, in, in terms of it, uh, there is a debate about it, but it's not. But it's, for whatever reason, strikes people personally, and um, they feel strongly about it uh, in both ways. I, 
I would say as council members, we get emails from all over from people that are saying, please make everyone wear masks and please don't make people wear masks. So it doesn't, you can never really be on the right side. Uh, you'll hear from people. And I guess I would echo council member Wilkerson. Um, it's uncomfortable to be in that crossfire, but at the same time, we do have to look at our community and who we're serving and who we're hurting if we do something and who we're hurting if we don't do something. And that's what makes it challenging. Okay, so you have any chat requests yet or Facebook requests? I don't think so. Okay. See anything else in the chat? Um, no, I don't think so. I think if that's all, I'm going to pass it back to Chris to close all of this up. Yeah, so awesome. What a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate it. With, um, good questions and answers. I learned a lot. Uh, so we once again thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate the city council members who are able to make it and help us with this. Um, and a big thank you also to everyone who made this possible. Um, special thanks to Alanda and Hannah Lee for communicating and really bridging the two groups together. Um, so maybe just like uh, if people do want to contact city council, um, you all have emails, I assume, that they can um, contact you at. Um, there's also a city council email, too, that, um, that people can send general, general questions to, um, as I understand. So um, thank you, everyone, and, and have a wonderful day. And thank you again for joining us for this discussion. All right. Well, and thank you. I'd, you know, I've gotten to know your uh, Student Advocacy Association over the last few years, and I really appreciated uh, your taking an interest in the community where you're going to school. Many of the students are not from here and they may only be here for a while, but uh, actually on the ground work and engagement has been helpful. We've had uh, students again over the last few years uh, present to us at study session in different ways. So I hope people continue to do that. And yes, if you go to Spokane City Council, if you Google that, we have pages where you can get our individual emails if you want to contact us individually. And then there's also a portal that you can put an email to all of us just and all of our staff at the same time. Uh, so feel free to reach out um, and express your interest in anything. Uh, but also, if you have a particular research project or something that you might want to partner with in the city, uh, you know, Check us out, and we if we can do it, great. If if not, we may know someone else who can partner with you. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson. And I'll just leave with invite us. Yep. That is always the option. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We love invitations. Yep. yep. And we'll keep inviting everyone. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's good. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Again. I really, really appreciate um, it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and you're welcome to view a little longer. We're going to actually talk about um, potential uh, procedures and debating fluoride uh, going ahead. So if you're interested in that, hang on. But otherwise, uh, we'll see you around. And with that, I'll switch over. I did send an email out yesterday just with some thoughts to start thinking about. Uh, really, I had two goals. One, uh, to make things as accessible as people who want to testify as they can. Uh, so that we could go ahead of time and kind of tell people what the plan might be. And secondly, to make it as uh, orderly and understandably uh, given our technological limitations. So I guess I would just throw it out there. Uh, if I'm assuming people have looked at it, but if people have comments or ideas, again, I'm, this is just kind of a default proposal to see what people think. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, uh, so I, my, my main thought or concern is just limiting the number of speakers. And if we only do two hours, I'm just a little worried that, that we may have quite a few more. I mean, maybe we won't. I know we were surprised on a couple of previous votes, but um, I just think if we can accommodate, you know, as many as possible, especially with some of the technical issues we had with the forum and some folks didn't get to speak and so um, I know I think our current rules with COVID says we go till nine. I mean, I would just, I would rather just set it and say, we'll move all the proclamations, we'll move everything off except for that one street vacation. 
move into this issue and we'll basically take testimony right up until maybe 10 minutes to nine or something like that at least um, if, if we have that many callers. Um, that's my main thought. And then the other is on your number six point here about city first and then county. I, I get that and that makes sense, but I would maybe expand it just slightly to say anybody who's on city water, uh, since there are some folks that are on city water that are, that are technically not in the city. Um, but so I'm not sure how to manage that last point exactly, but, uh, that, that's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Council member mom. Yeah, I agree with a, if someone's on a water system or impacted by the water system, I would even expand it. You know, so you've got someone who's like yeah. their height, they're using our water. Um, and then uh, can we move that? Um, uh, I think it's the end of the vacation that we're doing a hearing on. Can we do get that out of the way too? I don't want to have the wait for two and a half hours. I, yeah, I think. I think we have to do it that night, but my, my plan was that we would just do that right off the bat and get it. I don't think it will take long, so it'll just be five minutes, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And then are we anticipating a vote after this uh, back and forth? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that would be the point. It would be the debate and the vote on it with but one – one side matter, and I don't know that we're going to know anything about it today, but um, I just, I don't know if, uh, if Council Member Stratton is going to be available or not, given all that's going on in there. So that's the other potential thing. And I just, I haven't had a report on that lately, so I don't know. So I'm trying to remember our rules. So we can consider deferring it. It's that's something that was in the strategy. Yeah. Do we, we could, but uh, and have the testimony. But the testimony does remain open. I believe if we defer it, I think when we bring it back up, we still have a testimony again. Yeah. Well, we can we can make whatever rules we want as long as we have enough people to agree on what the rules are. So that's um, that would be the question: whether you wanted to have more. What I guess to me the question is. If we're not going to vote on it, do we want to defer it um, and all, or do you want to say we'll take all the testimony we're going to take and we won't take further testimony, but we'll vote once we have a full council? Or uh, there's different permutations out there. So I'm, I'm mainly looking for people to think through those and just kind of share their thoughts. And we're not going to do a formal vote today because it's not noted as a legislative session, but. Um, if we can kind of craft what seems like a consensus or what or lack of object not really consensus but lack of objections to things then we can put something together for 330 um, for a formal vote on either on what the rules would be so it's just helpful for me to hear from you all so that I know kind of what your thoughts are so great example was the uh, instead of city jurisdictional boundary, uh, water service boundary. So, you know, it's like, okay, that's a good thing to take into account. But other thoughts about any of those? Well, well I just want to get up for Council Member Stratton and say that I'm not comfortable voting without her. Yep, yep, yep. I, I agree. Um, and we may... We may know more Monday what that situation is or not. So. Other thoughts from anyone? Um, I'll just throw it out there. I think that there are some people who want this to go to a public vote. Okay. Well, that would be. And I think we need to consider that's an option here. Yep. And that, that, that would be, again, if we're in a. A legislative voting type session that would be in order so yeah so what what discussion have you heard about that i don't i haven't I, discussed that directly with anyone what that looks like or i mean we could so, so i guess I, brian's i'm on the call but one of the actions would be to defer until there is something like that, is that yep. technically what that would look like 
I, I think that's one possibility, yeah. Yep. Council President. Yep, Councilmember Cathcart. On yeah, on that note, I that that is certainly my my preference uh, would be that this goes to a ballot, and I, I frankly would prefer it go to either August or or November of next year, and not necessarily a solo special, especially with budget restraints and things like that that we would have to pay for. So, um, I think you know, again, we're not in a legislative session, so can't do anything here, but but certainly that is um, mm -hmm. of interest of mine. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Wilkerson. So clarity, uh, just to me, it would be an advisory vote. Uh, it would not be a deciding vote, and it, it would still come back to council. So I, I hear that we want the input, but we have been inundated um, with input, uh, council member Tad Cart from both sides. So it really feels like it's running 50-50 uh, right now based on the emails. So I don't know what would really be different um, by putting that in advisory vote uh, or even postponing it for another year uh, from council position because we still have to take a stand. Well, I, I guess I would suggest that the voters have voted three times. Three times they've, they've suggested they don't want this. The fourth time it didn't qualify. So, I mean, I, I think putting it into a, a vote, even if it's just an advisory and letting the people have some level of input you know, the, the one poll, not that I necessarily am going to make a decision based on a poll, but the one poll we've seen said 53%. I don't know what the um, the plus or minus on that was, but my guess is it's pretty darn close to 50-50. And, you know, I think the people should be should be making this, which is a very substantial decision uh, for themselves. Yeah. I was just going to note that that poll was 53.7% in favor and 34% against and the rest undecided. Um, what, any other? So, uh, just to continue. Yep. Yes. Continue. So, so one of the other difficulties, because I've run this scenario in my head, is what does this advisory vote look like? Just citizens of Spokane, water users, people who could potentially use our water with our time agreement. I think that is a difficult um, way to cut an advisory vote to be inclusive of all water users. So. I think people need to think about what that would look like. I don't even know if we have the ability to do that. So we may only be able to get city of Spokane voters as an advisory. I don't know. So I just want to put that out there to, to discuss that and think about it on Monday. If we are looking to do an advisory vote, how do you actually get that done? Yeah. And Councilman Mom, I, I would also, a concern of mine too is, is the way, if we do an advisory and it's tied specifically to the the grant how that would work out as well because there are some terms in the grant that that are i have strong concerns about and so how all of that kind of proceeds is is definitely an open question for me and and that's why i don't think we'd be ready on monday to actually pass this to to a ballot but i think deferring it to have those conversations is would be more of my preference and i was just going to speak to council member mum's concern I, we had the same problem on the uh joe albee stadium vote uh we could only do it for city voters because we were it was our thing we couldn't go outside the city and so we were splitting the school district so we were uh over inclusive of some areas that weren't part of uh that and under inclusive of others and so you you raise a challenge that i d i don't you know we can maybe find out but i don't think that is an option to do it by water service area, it would have to be within the city limits. So that's a that's an issue. Um, I have a couple questions to throw out there again based on this, but before I do that, any other um, kind of general thoughts by anyone? Again, mostly around process, which, um, all right. So uh, Council Member Cathcart was, um, talking about uh, going to nine o'clock and just, it, did anyone have any opinions on that um, or not? Um, not hearing that. I'm open. Long as, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I think as long as we tell people that they can, um, you know, continue to communicate with us right. and it, if a decision is not made, um, you know, sort of saying just because you didn't get 
airtime on this meeting, you know, we're always available, email, calls, et cetera. Uh, so. yep. And then my other question, um, and I think it's probably within council president's purview already under the rules, but if we, one of the options to try to get more people to testify within a limited time is to lower it to two minutes. I'm just wondering if anyone feels strongly opposed to that if needed to get more people to talk. Okay. It works for the Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That is helpful. Um, we will, on our end, uh, put together a sort of a written, something similar to what I emailed you and for a potential vote at 3.30 on Monday. And hopefully we'll have a little more information at that point uh, in terms of Council Member Stratton's availability. Um, Council Member, Mom, yeah. Yeah, and maybe this is hard to do under the system, but I know sometimes people attend or watch a meeting and they want to say, I'm in favor, but I don't want to speak. Mm -hmm. or I'm opposed and I don't want to speak. So I don't know if we have that option. So folks who don't want to have the airtime, they can still want to voice their support. Okay. Yep, we can explore that. The other thing I was just going to tell people that should be an improvement over our experience during the forum is probably you all know this, but just in case anyone else is watching, there is a pretty substantial delay between when we're speaking and it goes on the phone versus when it's broadcast. And so our, our supposition was that the reason we were not getting people raising their hand electronically was they were watching it, not listening. And so that, so by then we were on to the next person. So we are redoing our sign-in sheet to make that more clear if people read it. And then I am also going to repeat that multiple times during the event that if you want to uh, testify, you have to be listening on the phone for your name uh, and not relying on the television for it. And we're not going to do what we've done in the past when we had smaller groups of, you know, if we miss someone, try to find them. We're just not going to be able to do that. Um, but we'll give people lots of warning and education and notice on that, and hope, and we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, if people if they absorb that, we will have a much easier time getting people uh, on the line. So... Okay, anything else for the good of? Okay. Yes, sorry, I forgot to say this at the front end. Uh, we're about, it's, it's budget season, as people know, um, and we are, uh, I met with Council Member Kinnear and Mum, who've been working with me on this over the last few years on it, and we, have a suggestion that we each of our next committee meetings uh, tackle uh, a, b a bit of the line of business. And so Tim Dunavant, as you know, has sent out multiple emails asking for people's budget priorities. Uh, he has collected them. He has put them in a format of under each committee. Some of them could have gone under more than one, but they're under each committee. And so the idea is for the next uh, for committee meetings, uh, we will tackle uh, the, the items under that committee uh, section and just have a discussion about it. And we're not, again, we're not voting on it or anything like that, but we're just talking about it. And then that way the administration will see it. And then about a month from now, they're going to be coming uh, back to us with their presentations at each committee meeting under the same uh, portfolio of business with their proposals. And then they've also requested um, study sessions to go into more detail. And so it would be, you know, something like uh, the second week in October would be urban experience. They would present uh, 15 minutes maybe at committee. And then that study session for that week, we would dive into it in either greater, great, greater depth, even greater depth, um, and interaction. So that's, I just want to give people a preview that looks like that's where we're going. Um, happy to get input now or input uh, uh, later uh, on that. And 
but that's the way we're organizing it. And then at some point, of course, we'll get an actual uh, line item budget, which for the two new people you'll find is not an enjoyable experience because it's not user-friendly accessible. <laughs> uh, but uh, hopefully these sessions uh, with Tim Dunavant ahead of time and then the committee sessions and then the study sessions will make it a little bit easier uh, to figure out. And then we have to get it passed along with the capital improvement plan um, by our last meeting in December, hopefully closer to our first meeting in December. So any questions or comments about that? Okay, then Looks like I will be releasing all of us. Uh, have a good rest of the week and weekend, and we'll see you for uh, likely a long session on Monday evening. We're adjourned.